Vikes Now. I am Dustin Baker. We are one week away from mandatory minicamp, and I think a lot of Vikings fans will be on Jefferson watch to figure out if the guy shows up or if the holdout is genuine, because if I'm not mistaken, that's when fines can start to set in. But there are a lot of rumors in general about Jefferson and the Vikings kind of trickling in the Viking stratosphere. So what Tyler and I are going to do today, producer Tyler, is we're going to chat about whether or not they are real and discuss, you know, if they have legs or if they're smoke. A lot of these will be Jefferson themed, but there's a couple on here that will not involve him. So I'm going to launch into it first, though. Tyler, how are you? I'm doing well, man. How are you doing? Not bad. We uh, we're so close to the mandatory minicamp, and right now we're actually at, at a 100 days until the NFL regular season starts uh, with the Chiefs and the Ravens. So <clears throat> it's getting close. All right. The, the first thing I want to talk about here, this one is Jefferson themed. About a week and a half ago, ESPN published a theory that stated that Jefferson's would be extension. We've been waiting on the damn thing for 17 months. Um, that could come post July 31st. And the reason that I think this one actually makes sense, and this theory was uplifted in the ESPN tidbit, was Justin Jefferson and Joe Burrow share an agent. I name, I believe his name is Brian Iralt. And when Joe Burrow's deal, mega deal, got done, that came later on in the summer. And so what I think has happened here in tandem with that, you know, it's going to have to wait until later in the summer, is there indeed is a standoff between C.D. Lamb and Justin Jefferson that says, you go first. And the other guy's going, no, you go first. Because if C.D. Lamb gets $33 million, boom, Jefferson's probably going to get $34 million. If Jefferson is vice versa, gets $33 million, then I bet you the Cowboys have to do $33.5 for C.D. Lamb. So if you've seen any smoke about this damn thing is going to bleed into the summer, it's probably correct. The agent thing does make sense. And then on top of that, you have other voices, and we'll talk about this one a little bit later with another wide receiver rumor, is uh, Mike Florio, uh, profootballtalk.com, was on KFAN last week and claimed that the, the Vikings are playing games with Justin Jefferson. And I just want to say that I, I don't think that – there is some grand debate in Egan about, you know, should we really extend this guy? Because if there's one thing about Kevin O'Connell and Kwesi Dafa Mensa, they've been in the job for 28 months, is they don't usually lie. Like, Kwesi's gotten better at being diplomatic with his speak. Uh, you know, that first summer when he talked about uh, whether or not he should burn quarterback to the ground, uh, I think he said that, and he immediately realized, like, I think he said something to the effect that, no, not every team has a Tom Brady, and then the media took that as, oh, he doesn't like Kirk. So I think he's he's come to his senses that he has to be a little bit more uh, diplomatic with his words. But this new regime really doesn't lie. So every time they're in front of a microphone, Kevin O'Connell says a deal's going to get done. Je Kwesi said right after the draft that Jefferson should have it like a birthday month where he gets to celebrate it his whole month. Um, I don't think that the Vikings are playing games as insinuated by Mike Florio. So, Tyler, those are my takes on the Jefferson post July 31st theory. And then uh, I just flat out don't agree that they're playing hardball with him per Florio. What do you got on this front? Yeah, I think when the Vikings said that they were pretty much prepared to make Jefferson the highest paid non quarterback in the NFL, that they meant that. And I think part of that is a mutual agreement between the Vikings organization and Jefferson's camp that they don't mind waiting a little bit. They don't mind waiting until pretty much the last minute right before the season starts to get that extension done because that really assures Jefferson's camp that he's not signing too early. It's not a Daniil Hunter situation where, <laughs> you know, you're, you're losing more money by, you know, signing too early, right? So I don't think the Vikings are playing hardball with Jefferson. I, I think they're... If anything, it's the opposite. Jefferson's camp is the one playing hardball, and the Vikings are just totally okay with it. It's like, yeah, sure. We like the way I look at it is like if the Vikings truly believe that like Jefferson is the best non quarterback in the NFL, and I believe they do, they would have no problems with the whole I'm going to sign at the very last minute thing to maximize my value. Because if they believe it, then they're okay with it. Right. Mm -hmm. There there would only be a scuttlebutt between the two parties if there was some sort of, you know, philosophical disagreement on his value. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's the case. 
So to me, this is just Jefferson trying to maximize the amount of money he gets by uh, playing his cards right, trying to see if CD will sign. Because like, <laughs> if we're just comparing them one for one, Jefferson is so much better than CD Lamb. And, you know, I, I don't think he's going to fold before CD does. I'd be shocked. Yeah, and then you might recall last September, right before week one, there was a cat maneuver that was finagle. I can't remember if it was Brian O'Neill's deal was some of it was converted to signing bonus right before, like, I want to say like the Saturday, uh, it, the deal was so close where, and Quasi even talked about this right after the regular season um, as kind of a uh, proof that, Hey, you know, we were going to do this thing. And so when you think about that, um, the Vikings really also don't have this ginormous precedent of doing deals early in the summer, like whether it was Spielman or evidently uh, Quasi with Hawkinson, it usually goes into the summer. So um, I'm, I'm right there with you that I, 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 it gets on my nerves that we have to wait and do shows like this to debunk <laughs> some of the, the stuff that's out there. But there's just no way that the Vikings would either refuse to pay Jefferson or trade him as some of the shit we're going to get into because it, if you th if you take a step back and think about you know is there anything to this trade stuff you just drafted a rookie quarterback and you you're entering an era where you can pay the other guy in this case Jefferson all of the bucks and I can't any scenario see why the Vikings would get a rookie quarterback and then take away the best playmaker in football it's like opening a taco restaurant and eliminating tortillas like it just doesn't add up that this would be their team building strategy so. That's my two cents on that one. I'm fully prepared for it to go late into the summer. And I really don't have the, uh, aside from getting on my nerves a little bit, I don't have the anxiety like that some folks do. Like, oh God, is this thing really going to take until August? Yeah, it's, I, I'm not worried about Jefferson unless I absolutely have to be worried about Jefferson. And we're not going to reach that point until the season starts, right? Mm -hmm. And like, even if he doesn't show up to mandatory minicamp, I may be worried a little bit, but like Jefferson can take those fines. Like, <laughs> so like, like he's got enough money to, you know, deal with that. But I don't even think he's going to go down that route. I think no, I he, bet he'll be there. He doesn't, yeah, he doesn't want to be a diva and that would be diva ish. Yeah. He takes his role seriously as, mm -hmm. you know, one of the captains and leaders of this team. Uh, so recently, uh, Bleacher Report floated out a trade idea for the Minnesota Vikings. Oh, I love here. this one. Traylon Burks, Titans wide receiver, is now just kind of, what, wide receiver four in Tennessee because they went out, they got Calvin Ridley, they have DeAndre Hopkins, and then I forget, Tyler Boyd, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have, they have their version of a big three. <laughs> Mid three, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the mid three in Tennessee and Will Levis. Um, but yeah, Traylon Burks is now seemingly on the trade block, and Bleacher Report suggested that the Minnesota Vikings should trade a seventh rounder for Traylon Burks. Um, for me personally, I like if it's just like a seventh rounder or whatever, who cares? Mm -hmm. Right. Because you're, you're giving up next to nothing to take a chance on a guy like a cam makers. Um, I'm not a huge fan of Traylon Burks because I, I, I think Traylon Burks, the player in theory is better than what you're actually getting. Like, you know, his catch percentage isn't all that great. I think he's closer to like a KJ Osborne than he is like a legitimate wide receiver three where you have a guy who can be like a serviceable three, but you know, you don't want to have to rely on him all the time. If the Titans felt like they could rely on Burks all the time, they wouldn't mm -hmm. have signed Tyler Boyd. That to me is kind of like a red flag. So if you're getting him for next to nothing, sure like i'm i'm all for that you know buy low on a guy who had was drafted what was he a first rounder second rounder he, he was a first he was, yeah he was a former first round pick at wide receiver so he was from the lewis scene draft oh that's how yeah, it wasn't long ago <clears throat> yeah it's that 2022 draft man i'm i'm telling you but what are your thoughts on Traylon Burks, Dustin? Oh, I 
absolutely adore this idea. Like when I saw it was about a week and a half ago, the Bleacher Report had it. And I was just so tickled that the Vikings were the team named. And here's the deal for especially this summer and throughout the season. If you think that Kwesi Adafa Mensa will do his usual trade prowess, which is pretty frequent, you have to do deals like this because there's not other draft assets to trade. So normally we could, at this point on the calendar, we could say, hey, the Vikings could throw a fourth rounder to the blah, blah, blahs to get this sweet wide receiver. You can't really do that right now. And so you can take, you want to take anything you can get. So this trade theory is super exciting to me because A, Traylon Burks is, let's see, He's 24. He just turned 24, so he still has the youth there. He's huge. He's like 6'3", 225, and he would be a nice change of pace from Jefferson's, I guess, average size, Addison's small stature, and then you have almost this tight end like dude in the middle of the field. And if all it cost was a seventh rounder or a, one of those conditional six rounders, like uh, was it the Dobbs trade? A lot of times they have that conditional six. If he plays, blah, 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 snaps. Um, I would love this because... It's, it's a better upside to what they have at WR3 right now. We already know who the WR1 and WR2 are. No debates about that. But right now, everybody else has a different opinion about, hey, it's going to be Brandon Powell. I think it'll probably be Brandon Powell person. And then Trent Sherfield, he was the, the projection of NFL.com last week. And then Alec Lewis, uh, the Athletics, said, you know what, Jalen Naylor looks fantastic. So everybody is saying that WR3 is going to be something different. I think Burks can be the guy where we kind of just circle him and say, yep, He's going to be the WR3, and we can end the debate and have an honest-to-goodness WR4 debate, which, which this should be in the first place between the guys I just named off. So, yeah, I would love this for you know up to the conditional sixth. Um, Dynasty fantasy football managers will tell you all about Traylon Burks, and not in a good way, because he was supposed to be like Brian Thomas this year. You know, He was a first round. He was 18th overall pick, and so we had grand plans for him. And this is a quasi type deal. Uh, he hasn't done it very successfully with Jalen Rager or Ross Blacklock when he first got on the job, but this is the perfect type of deal where Quasi always talks about low risk. And then the reward if Traylon Burks is anywhere remotely as good as a scouting report was said, scouting report said two years ago, um, he should be open all of the time with Jefferson and Addison. Yeah. I, I would add that. Like I wouldn't give anything more than a, like a conditional six round yeah, kick for Trey Burks. Because it, because it's like he still have guys out there like Hunter Renfro, right? Who are free agents mm-hmm. who you can sign like immediately. You don't have to yep. give up any draft capital for a guy like that. Now maybe Renfro is probably asking for more money than like you know what's on Traylon Burks contract. But the point is, is like anything more than like a, a late day three pick, you're kind of sitting there like, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> But yes. the, the upside with Traylon Burks is, you know, it is evident, right? So it'll be interesting to see if Tennessee even trades him or if they just stash him. Yeah, well, one thing's for sure is he will be the WR4 there unless Tyler Boyd gets hurt or something like that. Because although we call it the mid three, it's an experienced mid three. So they, they are going to be on the field. And I don't know if it's just that they would want to give uh, Burke's a second chance elsewhere because when you, let's face it, getting a seventh rounder for a first rounder, it would be like if we trade C in this summer and get a seventh rounder, it'll be considered a colossal failure. And that's what the Titans would have to concede. And Burks was even like picked 14 picks before seen. Um, all right. The next one. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, hold on. You, you just triggered a thought in my brain. Uh, what is it? <clears throat> do the Titans need safety help? I've <laughs> seen for seen for Burks. Let's seen do for it. Burks straight up. <laughs> yeah, that can work. You heard it here first. Um, yeah, we'd have to pull that up. It's a new regime. I'm going to guess. Let's see. Um, let me do that here in, in the backdrop. Problem is with their safeties, I'm not going to really know who the hell they are. Amani they Hooker, fourth have... rounder from 2019. You know, don't I don't have like Myard and those guys anymore. No, uh-uh. Um, they just got Legeria Sneed at corner. And uh, they got that free agent from the Bengals that I wanted the Vikings to get at corner, Chibodi uh, Wazui. I don't know how to say his last name. Yeah, it looks like they need some decent help. At, yeah, so you heard it here first. We're just going to trade scene straight up for Burke, and it'll be a wash. Let's see which one is a, less of a bust. Yeah, I love that. Yep. All right. So the next one, this was the inspiration for the show, believe it or not, because the Pioneer Press – this weekend, Charlie Walters, uh, I think he writes a weekly Minnesota sports thing, and then it usually leans heavy on Vikings. I'm going to read the quote here. 
Uh, he wrote, Psst, as if he's trying to get your attention. There was buzz at draft time that the Vikings wanted to move from number 11 to number five, not to pick a quarterback, but to get LSU wide receiver Malik Neighbors, who was picked number six by the Giants. Had the trade occurred, Jefferson would have been traded and Neighbors would have been the WR1. Um, all right, so in that, if you search Malik Neighbors Vikings, there's about 20 articles written about this, so it's well covered. Um, but my problem with that theory is very singular. So right after round one of the draft, Pro Football Talks, Mike Florio was, uh, I think, just tweeted, like a video of himself, advancing this theory that said, ah, 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 there was a call to number five, and Malik Neighbors was sought after, but it was the Minnesota Vikings who wanted him. And we were all like, what? We just got our quarterback, our edge rusher. Why do we want Malik Neighbors? They're going to go three deep again? What's the deal? My problem with this is the Florio theory was advanced on like April 27th or April 26th. And then that was it. We were all like, oh, that's kind of weird. And now it was brought back to life by a guy who says there was buzz about neighbors to the Vikings. I can say buzz about anything. I can say, hey, there's buzz that LeBron James is going to the Spurs because he's a free agent and he pairing with Wimby would be really cool. That's my buzz. I have I have beef with the reporting saying there was buzz when we know what the buzz was. It was Mike Florio who is wrong a lot of the time. Uh, so it's it's as if this got new bona fide legs from a story that was dead in the water about a month ago. Um, so I don't necessarily believe that neighbors was the target. I don't know if there was like a, a way that they could have had all three McCarthy Davers and Turner. Maybe it just that seems really odd, but I just don't believe that Jefferson has ever been a trade commodity. And I think it would be borderline unforgivable. If Quasi Dafamensa said, my plan for the Vikings is to draft this 21 year old quarterback and trade like the third best player in the NFL. Yeah. And on that too, is we have like zero context as to when this call supposedly happened, if it even did. But if we're entertaining the fact that it might have happened, did this happen before free agency when the Vikings were juggling between Kurt Daniel and Jefferson? And well, what if we have to trade Jefferson because we're keeping Kirk and Daniel and maybe we trade up to five for neighbors? Mm -hmm. Like that would have been plausible because, you know, you'd you would then have a hole to fill theoretically at wide receiver. But like once you got rid of Kirk and Daniel, it makes, it makes no sense. Why would you <laughs> trade up to five for neighbors? Is it just general? Like, is it a partial smoke screen where it's like the Vikings were interested in five, but not in neighbors. That's just what they're telling you. Like they were interested in McCarthy at five, or if may fell down to five, would they have traded up for that? Like, I I don't even know what to make of this. To me, this is like two of, I mean, there's probably like Rick Sosa out there, if you can even call him this, but like two of the least reliable Vikings, quote unquote, sources that exist are Florio and Charlie Walters. Well, I guess Florio is sometimes right, to be fair. I feel like every time I run across a Charlie Walters thing it's like he, he's talking about like four different sports at the same time he's he's got that mm -hmm. little uh article series he does and it's just nuggets and mm -hmm. like i never hear anything substantial come out of those like there's never any like follow-up like oh charlie was right the whole time like tip our hat to charlie i it, it always just comes out of nowhere with walters i i don't know where any of this neighbor stuff is coming from and i Without much context around it, I, I think it's just like intentionally misrepresented. Like that could be either it's fake or it's so highly out of context that you don't even understand why the Vikings would have entertained that to begin with. Yeah, I think uh, Walters accurately predicted that Cousins would get $45 million from somewhere. And if I recall correctly, when that came out in February or whatever, that was a big turnoff for Vikings fans because we thought the team-friendly thing was alive. And one's definition of team-friendly was really varying. Like, 
I thought team friendly for Kirk would be 40 million. And I think score North thought it was like 10 million. Uh, so when it came out that Walter said cousins is going to get 45 million, it shattered all team friendly dialogues. And it turns out he was right there. Uh, but yeah, certainly his, his column is the, the nuggets that say, Hey, yeah, this is what I heard about blah, blah, blah. And on this one, I just, I don't understand. So if they would have traded up for, they would have had to given like the 23rd pick and their pick. So then you go get neighbors and, <laughs> and, the, and are then, you giving up a 2025 first at no, that the, point? To... Well, you would, if they were at, let's see, they were at 11 to get up to five. You'd have to give your, I think you'd have to give your 23. Third overall pick, maybe, maybe it was, maybe they thought they could keep the twenty third, and then you have neighbors at five. Then you flip Jefferson for somebody's first rounder. So I guess the plan would have been, all right, we know McCarthy's falling, or if we secretly love Bo Nix, and then maybe you could have all three. Like, I mean, it you really have of, to. It's, it's it's a foundation of hope that the draft board falls your way, um, but. The price to get up from eleven to five, how much would that have cost? I, I don't know. It's like I I would have to think if you're going from eleven to five, you're giving up either twenty three or that. Yeah, yeah, because or... yeah, when we were talking about McCarthy at five, it was automatic that it would be eleven and twenty three, and you hope the Chargers would ask for next year's first rounder. So yeah, it was basically a roundabout way to get neighbors and McCarthy somewhere. And instead, yeah. you're going to be able to pay Jefferson, you have McCarthy, and by the way, you had Dallas Turner. So it just, it really doesn't add up. I, I feel like this would have had more legs to it if, you know, Walters and uh, Florio had said the Vikings were really interested in like Romeo Dunze. Mm -hmm. be because like throughout the entire draft, we knew like, okay, Cardinals are probably getting Harrison Jr. And the Giants, mm -hmm. if they're not going quarterback, are going neighbors. So, like, those guys were, like, locks for the top five, top six. Like, Odunze fell to nine. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and the Vikings traded up to ten. So, so like, Odunze would have been so much more of a plausible, you know, get for the Vikings to where if you heard smoke about the Vikings going after Odunze, then you're sort of like, wait a minute. Or if you hear smoke about Brian Thomas or like a Donnie Mitchell, it's like, hold up. They're actually looking at like all of the first round wide receivers. It's just not like neighbors and Harrison, like the guys they obviously can't get. So, yeah. And then Adunze just happened to be at that number nine spot with the bears. And that was basically, I mean, you that's who they wanted and you couldn't trade with them because it's the NFC North. So, <laughs> Jefferson flew out to uh, New Jersey. <laughs> this is the most uh, egregious one of the week. Th th yeah, this one. Uh, he flew out to New Jersey, some like minor uh, airport uh, near the New York Jets facility. <laughs> and the internet uh, naturally is saying, oh, Jets to the Jets, everybody. You know, Get Aaron Rodgers another weapon in Justin Jefferson. He's in New Jersey. Uh, I I think this is stupid. Uh, <laughs> just like there's really only one reason. I'll, I'll I'll just let you go to this first, and I'll corroborate it because because we're gonna have the same exact opinion on this as mm -hmm. to like why he's in uh, New Jersey. I'll I'll just let you take this this is this is easy <laughs> all right this one came from ml football which is a large aggregator uh certainly on twitter i don't know if it has instagram and all the other stuff but uh yeah it came out and said it was an exclusive uh justin jefferson has touched toes down in new jersey four miles four minutes something from the new york jets headquarters and it heavily insinuated that a trade was on the way so the first hilarious part is Players can't just go chat with other teams like when they're under contract. You can't, you know, JJ McCarthy can't waltz to Las Vegas and chat with the Raiders brass. That's not how this works. You can't even barely do that in free agency until it gets hot and heavy, unless you're the Falcons. And so, like, it's it's really bizarre that even an aggregator 
like that may not have much like credible sourcing would think that you could get away with tweeting it. Players can't go meet with other teams unless it's the heart of free agency after legal tampering. So that's the first absurdity. And then secondly, uh, it was in New Jersey. And I know there was like uh, some that said, hey, he's meeting with the Wilfs. And I'm like, all right, well, that could make sense. But realistically, Jefferson has an ongoing legal matter with some woman. I don't know if it's a paternity anything or something of the sort. And that that is being resolved in New Jersey. So it's like 100 million times more likely that he is in New Jersey to deal with a matter like that than it is he's meeting with Joe Douglas about a trade because everybody all, that trade would be canceled in a heartbeat because you went and talked with them. And like, it's just not how it works. So I, I, I was stunned how people ran with this. I understand sometimes like the bears fans, the Packers fans will do like eye emojis just to get the things riled up. That's how it goes. <laughs> NFC for, North news. Where yeah. it's like, <laughs> but, but for the folks to think that this was a real thing, like, Oh, is Jefferson going to the jets? Like, it's like, what? Yeah, it's the the whole thing's really dumb. But on the off chance that like this is football related, it's actually a good thing for the Vikings. Apparently, the Wilfs have some sort of residence within 20 miles of the airport that he landed in. Mm -hmm. So, like, maybe this is like a Glenn Taylor Jefferson's going to the Wilf residence to eat some lasagna and, you know, <laughs> look them in the eye, give them a nice firm handshake before they give him an unprecedented deal. You promise <laughs> you're going to keep your in and like Wiggins all over again, except this is, you know, like the best non quarterback in the NFL and not Andrew Wiggins. So, I know the analogy isn't perfect. But yeah, this whole thing is really stupid. Uh, like, I don't even believe in the Wilf part of that. Like, oh, he's in town to visit the Wilfs because these guys are billionaires. If they needed to meet with Jefferson, they'd just show up at TCO Studios. They wouldn't like, I mean, is it plausible that Jefferson shows up to the Wilf residence, knock up, knocks on their door and says, hey, come on in. We got lasagna for you. Like, maybe, but I... I, I think this is just Jefferson running some errands like and nothing more. And it just so happens to be in New Jersey. Yeah. And well, that that's what it is. I mean, it's 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 the legal thing. And it was just conveniently left out of the aggregators tweet. All right. The last thing I got for you, Tyler, before we log off for Tuesday, uh, Timberwolves tonight. Do they extend the series? Are you a believer or do you think this thing is cooked? I wanted to believe to uh believe so bad but <laughs> i i think dallas is gonna get the sweep and i i try not to be pessimistic about the wolves there there's a lot of wolves rhetoric going on right now oh you know the, the trade cat thing the whole everyone's switching up on ants because suddenly he's not playing like the second coming of michael jordan and like yeah our our two best players are struggling rudy gobert unsurprisingly can't there's no center in the league who can cover Luca on the perimeter uh and like Gobert is getting dogged for that three-pointer mm -hmm. from game two but my my thing with the Timberwolves in the Mavericks too is one I don't think people are giving Dallas enough credit I think people sort of you know thought in the back of their mind that Oh, Dallas is the fifth seed. Minnesota is coming off of a series where they beat the defending champions. You know, we should have this series relatively in the bag. Like, I hate to break it to any Timberwolves fans who thought this way, but if you think that in the conference finals that there's going to be an easy matchup, you're, <laughs> you're sorely mistaken. Seeding doesn't matter at that point. Any team that makes it to the conference finals is there for like a legitimate reason. And seeding just goes out the window. There's no such thing as like, oh, this is an easy matchup. Like even the Pacers, like the Pacers got swept, but like they were in every single game with the Celtics. Mm -hmm. The Celtics didn't get any of those wins easy. No, nope. like I, I, I think people underestimated the, the Mavs. Lively and Gafford are really active on the boards, uh, more so than any centers on any teams that we've played in the playoffs up to this point. Uh, and then Kyrie and Luka is quite literally the most difficult uh, set of guards to <laughs> to cover for, for, for anyone. Like, like if... 
if Jaden McDaniels and Anthony Edwards can't slow down Kyrie and Luca, no one can. Like Kyrie, we're talking about a guy who uh, has arguably the best handle of all time, and Luca has ten years of like playoff experience. <laughs> like he's he's been a professional since he was like thirteen or sixteen years old, something like that in Europe. So that that is just such a tough team to beat when you're talking about a team that's really active on the boards. Plus they've got two elite closers. Like there's, there's no stopping that. Um, but the, the Timberwolves just need to improve their depth uh, next season, uh, be aggressive in free agency, find some guys who can shoot off the bench and they'll be in the same place as this year where they're competing for a championship. Yeah. The, the problem once you get here against Kyrie and Luca, who are in their, their best form right now as members of Mavericks is both of those guys create their own shot. And, you know, when you say the best backcourt in history, like they're the immediate debate is well, what about clay and Curry clay didn't create his own shot ever. Like he could nail that shot hundred percent of the time it felt like, but it was always him like getting the ball and then shooting it. These two guys, like it, it, you can't, you can't let you can't contain them both, but you can even contain one because they're both so deadly, um, like off the dribble and like with Clay, you just had to wait. All right, well he'll hit the shot when the ball is passed to him, and that's what makes these guys unique. So on the whole, Clay and Steph, you know, have a more documented record of you know the championships, but this one is just so unique because it's almost like the supersized version of Damon Lill Damian Lillard and C.J. McCollum when they tried to make that work. These two guys like with the game on the line, it's just, it's, it's a knife through your, through your heart. Uh, yeah. It's people underestimated them. I wouldn't be surprised if the Mavericks beat Boston in the finals. Like if they're Chris, that good. If Chris stops isn't back, I think they have a chance. Um, but if Chris stops is back and healthy, which is kind of a big question mark that gives them a Supreme advantage um, there. And also remember Wolves fans, um, this, the Anthony Edwards is 22 years old and this, type of stuff might happen uh, for a while. It took Jordan till age 27. It took LeBron till age 27. Giannis got his first one at 28. And so uh, it makes all the sense in the world. I mean, Edwards is basically following the script right now. Like you, you, what is it? You walk or you crawl before you can walk. And, you know, and some of his crawling has been masterful, but this is what happens to young superstars is sometimes like the, the light is a little bit too bright to be a consistent mercenary every single game all right sir well thanks for joining you're going to try to be a mainstay of tuesday um next tuesday is no good though because i will be in norway um but once i get back uh, we'll have you on tuesdays and by that time we'll be really be getting close to some july dealings um all right my man well you have a wonderful day okay all right enjoy norway all right take it easy